thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Let me just, I think. So this talk is on type proofs of space, and I'll explain uh, what those are. So first, a proof of space is an alternative to proof of work, where the resource uh, being used is space instead of computational energy. So it should require the prover uh, who's producing this proof to use significant space. And it has all the same applications as proof of work, including applications to spam prevention or mitigating denial of service attacks, and most famously to civil resistance in consensus networks like Bitcoin. The advantage of a proof of space is that it, uh, space is a reusable resource. So producing a new proof of space can reuse the same space, unlike uh, a proof of work, which requires consuming uh, new energy. So it's proposed as a more eco-friendly way of getting a system like Bitcoin. So what does a proof of space uh, look like? It's an interactive protocol between a prover uh, and a verifier where the, the prover is um, allowed to choose the amount of space that it commits to store. It sends a commitment to the verifier. The verifier sends a challenge and the prover produces a, a proof that should convince the verifier that it is using almost all of the storage that it claims to be using. Um, as efficiency requirements, though, you require the proof and the commitment to be much smaller than the storage that the prover claims to have. Um, so the overall communication should be much smaller than the storage. Uh, and uh, the verifier uh, should also run efficiently. So uh, if n, say, is the amount of storage the prover claims to be using, then the verifier should run in polylog n time. There's also a non-interactive uh, version of proof of space, or any proof of space protocol, since by definition, um, is pu public coin, the fiat Shamir heuristic can be applied in order to um, get a non-interactive version where the challenge is derived as a hash of the prover's commitment. So in the literature on proof of space, there's a differentiation, though, between two types of proof of space. Uh, the one which I just described may only convince the verifier that the prover is using a lot of space in order to produce the proof, but it may not be required to persistently use space over time. So a proof of persistent space is one where the prover it demonstrates that it continuously uses space over time, and this is divided into two phases, one which is an initialization protocol that looks much like the one I just described. It can be either interactive or non-interactive. And then the prover uh, enters an online phase where it fields challenges from the verifier and uh, computes responses that should convince the verifier that it is still storing a, a lot of space. Uh, rather than continuously rerunning the initialization, the online phase is uh, seen as a separate phase because it, it, it can be much more efficient for the, for the prover to do. Uh, the initialization phase could require the prover to do a lot of work. Now, notice something um, regarding you know, the efficiency of initialization versus the online phase. If the prover could just rerun the initialization to respond to the online challenges, then uh, clearly this wouldn't work as a proof of persistent space. The prover could delete its space after each challenge and then redo the initialization in order to respond to challenges. So in the, de the way that we define this is by uh, restricting the time that the prover has to respond to challenges, and in particular, the, the time that the prover has to respond to these uh, challenges uh, should be much shorter than the time it takes for it to run the initialization. So how tight is a proof of space? That's the principal question that uh, this paper explores. In other words, how much space can some adversarial prover save and still pass the protocol? Could it pass the protocol with only one minus epsilon gigabytes if it claims to be using a gigabyte? And uh, for a tight proof of space, the answer should be no for one minus epsilon as close to one as possible. In other words, a smaller epsilon gives you a tighter proof of space. So we can define epsilon tightness as saying that if the online prover stores less than one minus epsilon gigabytes, then it should fail with overwhelming probability, 
to respond within some time limit t, t is typically set to be proportional to uh, the storage size. A, a weaker way of defining um, proof of space security would allow for a time space trade off. In this definition, even a parallel, uh, parallel prover who uses a lot of parallelism in order to speed up um, its response time to get it smaller than t should fail. Um, whereas we, we could allow for a time space trade off where the prover should simply have to do a lot of computational work if it chooses not to use that much space persistently. So in, in, in this work, I, I define a, a, a tight proof of space as one which can be tuned to be arbitrarily tight. So the protocol parameters could be tuned for any epsilon less than one so that it is epsilon tight as just defined. Um, the problem is that while tuning the parameters to, uh, to be a tighter proof of space for smaller epsilon, they may also impact the efficiency, and so we'd like to maintain efficiency. And so the efficiency goal is to keep the proof size or communication and the increase in computation proportional to 1 over epsilon um, as epsilon gets smaller. Uh, intuitively, the reason why uh, it seems that 1 over epsilon is sort of the best we can do is that the, the way that at least the information theoretic versions of the online uh, challenges work, the, the prover is, has to store uh, some string of large size, and, the, uh, and if, it for, for, if it forgets too much of that string, then the verifier's challenges will sort of catch it on, on the errors that it made or the, the parts of the space that it forgot. So if it, only for, if it only forgot 1% of the space, then the probability that the verifier's challenges will locate, will, will be in that area of space, um, you know, is, is only good enough if the number of challenges is close to one over, is, you know, order of 1 over epsilon, or lambda over epsilon. So in this work, we get epsilon tightness with um, a proof size, which is seemingly close to optimal, or order of log n over epsilon. So what was the state of the art before this work? Well, proofs of space were first introduced in 2015, and that construction had 1 minus epsilon um, less than 1 over, 1, 1 over 512, which would mean that the, the, there could be an adversary who uses only a 512th fraction of the data. Now, note that these numbers don't indicate that there is actually an attack that achieves that, but just gaps in the analysis. Uh, Ren and Devadas improved this in 2016 and made 1 over epsilon closer to 1 half. Okay. And um, a construction from 2017 was a different type of proof of space, but it wasn't tight. And then in 2018, we had the first tight proof of space. Um, although, unfortunately, in that construction, the proof size increases proportional to log n over epsilon squared. So it, it, which, which makes a big difference for, for efficiency. Let's say epsilon is you know, 1 over 100. Um, and furthermore, that construction used these very special types of depth robust graphs, which we don't have practical instantiations of. We have asymptotic constructions, um, but even heuristically, we haven't really been able to, to demonstrate that it has uh, this property. So, Why do tight proofs of space matter? Well, one, you can get pr better provable security for proof of space, just like in any, um, the goals of any uh, uh, tight security exercise. Uh, we would like the gap between what the honest uh, prover has to do and the ad best possible adversary to be small, as either we have to tune the parameters for the worst possible adversary and make life extremely hard for the honest provers, or we set life to be reasonable for the honest provers, and then there's some adversary that virtually doesn't have to use any space at all. Uh, but a second motivation is that it's necessary for uh, this new type of primitive called proof of replication. And I won't go into proof of replication in this talk since it's actually extraordinarily uh, tricky to define properly, and um, it would, would require a lot of uh, time to explain. But I will talk about useful proofs of space, which are very related to proofs of replication, um, and also greatly benefit from tight proofs of space. So I'll explain that next. So what is a useful proof of space? It's a, a proof of space where, additionally, that's a correctness requirement, the prover is able to use its storage 
to store files of its own interest. So it doesn't have to waste the space as it's engaging in the proof of space protocol. So cool, I can still uh, use my space to store my movies. What is an application? Well, if you think about the application of proof of space to um, building blockchains like a Bitcoin alternative, one of the things that we're concerned about with blockchains is the so-called blockchain carbon footprint. You know, proof of work based Bitcoin it wastes a lot of energy since uh, all the miners in the system um, continuously use a lot of energy to maintain the system. And proof of space, we said, is more eco-friendly because it uh, can reuse the same space, so it, it doesn't waste energy or require more, consuming more space um, you know, every minute. Um, but it does, still doesn't do anything positive, and you could say that the, the, the space is still not being used for anything useful. So um, a useful proof of space would push this even further and have a, so to say, positive footprint, because what the work that the miners are doing to maintain the, the Bitcoin-like system is, can also simultaneously be used uh, for data storage. So consider a system where the miners are all mining for the blockchain and, and using their space for, for useful uh, data storage. One of the things that we'd be concerned about is that at some point in time, one of the miners finds a cheat that lets it gain a huge advantage in the proof of space protocol. And unfortunately, let's say that that cheat no longer uh, it's different than the honest protocol, and so it doesn't necessarily have the same correctness property as the honest protocol. It perhaps does not allow this prover to still store data, useful data. Well, news travels fast, and all the other miners catch on, and eventually this falls back to just a proof of space blockchain, and it's no longer doing useful data storage. So one implication of tight proofs of space is that we can you know, sleep well or rest assured that nobody will find some adversarial strategy that saves significantly from deviating from the honest protocol. One other thing that we would be concerned about is how efficient is it is to extract data from this useful proof of space. So let's say somebody wants to retrieve the movie that the miner is storing if that takes a really long time, then that may be undesirable for the application, and you can think of it as it being a little bit less useful, uh, but maybe still useful for storing you know, uh, archival backups. Um, but unfortunately, a caveat of, of data extraction efficiency is that efficient extraction implies that the proofs of space are not asynchronously composable. Uh, so let me illustrate why that is. Let's say there's a, a proof of space um, miner and the, the, the or prover, and the, the prover encodes a data file f in its proof of space and stores this encoding of f as its persistent storage. And then um, after that, initializes another proof of space where the data input, which it can choose, is the, in, is the same storage that it needs to pass the other proof of space uh, protocol. So now it, can o it only needs to store the, the second double encoding of f, and by the efficiency of extraction, it could efficiently extract f uh, during the online challenges and be able to respond to the challenges for both proofs, uh, pretending to use twice the amount of space, but really only using half that amount. So, that would be a problem. Um, but we're going to ignore that. There, there are uh, perhaps ways of dealing with that in, uh, in applications where there's a stronger uh, promise on what, what, what files are being stored by the system. So we'll ignore that for now. So let me talk about, in the remaining time, um, the construction. So the construction of many proofs of space um, works by labeling a, a directed acyclic graph. So what is a graph labeling? Um, we use a collision-resistant hash function, H, and um, label each node of the, of the DAG with, uh, with a data input. In this case, we can just choose it to be the index of that node. The source node is given the label, which is just a hash of its, uh, of its index, and every other node is given a label, which is derived as a hash of its data index and also all its dependency labels, so all the labels on nodes that have an edge to that node, and so on and so forth until we label the whole graph. And the way the proof of space 
works, or this family of proof of space protocols work, are by sending a commitment to the graph labels, receiving a challenge, which is a subset of the nodes, and then opening the labels of the nodes um, in this challenge set, and also their parents, and the verifier will check that this hash relationship is correct, at least on the, the challenge indices. So it can be shown that for special types of uh, directed acyclic graphs, this gives a proof of space, because if the prover forgets too many of the labels, it will require doing sequential work. We just heard two talks on proofs of sequential work. It will require doing sequential work in order to rederive those labels and respond correctly to the challenge. So let me give you just a, a very high-level overview of the construction I, I give in this paper. Um, and so don't expect to understand all the details here. I just want to give you a roadmap so that you have in your uh, picture in your mind of what the next um, few slides will be on. The first step is to build a very weak, not tight proof of space just from something called a depth robust graph. Um, and the depth robust graph that we require is uh, simply one where if you look at a very large subset, so say on 80% of the nodes, any 80% subset contains a long path, directed path. Um, and intuitively, this gives you a not tight proof of space, because if you for delete like 80% of the graph, then in order to rederive nodes, any, the label on any node within that, it will require you to uh, compute labels along a long path, and that requires sequential work. The next step is to amplify this to get a tighter proof of space by layering depth robust graphs and adding bipartite expander um, edges between the layers, and we can show that that gets you a tight proof of space, but not one where you can extract data from it efficiently. And so the last step is to sort of make the picture prettier, and uh, I, I call this local, uh, it's called localization as a technique in proof of space, where um, we basically absorb the edges of the bipartite expander graph or project them into the layers. Um, we will have to reverse the edges of the depth of our graph at every layer um, for reasons I'll get into later it's in order to maintain um, the proof of space security. But what it ends up with is a graph structure where each layer can basically uh, encode the labels of the previous layer and extracting data from this um, can be done more efficiently. So first, uh, the first step is the, uh, this depth robust graph. So uh, remember, I said a depth robust graph can be defined in, in many ways. As, as a very strong uh, depth robust graph is one where if you delete any constant size subset, that constant size subset maintains depth. But um, I actually can get we can get away with with using the the weakest possible depth robust graph, which just requires to be um, robust in very large subsets. And um, so, as I explained before, uh, intuitively, this if you just apply the the labeling game to this graph, it gives you a weak proof of space. Now, uh, what is a bipartite expander graph? Um, there's two sets uh, of there's sinks and sources, and um, we say that it's an alpha beta expander if any subset of size alpha and A has um, is connected to at least a, a beta fraction of B. And this is said to have beta over alpha expansion. So uh, the first construction, step two, takes copies of a depth or bus graph. Right? Mark here in red the edges of the depth or bus graph, so every layer has a copy of a depth or bus graph. And then adds the edges of bipartite expander graphs um, between them. And uh, the labels are derived on the last layer and stored. Uh, so let me give you some intuition about why this gives you a tight uh, proof of space. Uh, so consider uh, sort of just a naive attack that stores labels on the last level and forgets some of the labels. So let's say it forgets, it deletes the labels in, in red. Maybe rederiving just those labels if it were only one layer would not require sequential work, but because of the bipartite expander edges, if we look at the de dependencies of these labels on labels in previous le um, levels that are not being stored and would need to be rederived, the dependencies expand as you move up in the graph until the dependencies include 80% uh, of some level. And since the graph was depth robust, 
in 80% size subgraphs, rederiving 80% of any given level requires sequential work. Um, and you can use this to encode data simply by taking the last la layer and XORing it with the data uh, file of interest. I'm omitting some details on how you would modify the, the proof. But the main point is that, unfortunately, this uh, sort of generic way of using the proof of space to uh, encode data requires you to rederive deterministically the labels, and so it would be as inefficient to extract data as it is to generate or initialize a proof of space to begin with. So the last step is modifying the structure of this graph. And what we do is we project the edges of the expander of the bipartite expander into um, each level. And what this does, it has the effect of turning each level into a expander graph is an undirected graph. So it's an undirected expander, but it's a DAG, so it's not it's not a you know, it, it, it's not actually a, an expander graph. Is. Um, and uh, so, uh, and, and so before I tell, give you the security intuition, uh, the reason why this allows you to encode data in a more efficiently extractable way is that now the dashed edges will be used to derive um, a label which encodes the same index label on the previous level. Uh, so if you look at like C6, it will be derived by hashing the dependencies of C6 in the same level and using that as a key to encode C1, simply using XOR, let's say. And, um, and so the, the labels on the last level are actually encodings of the labels on the previous, uh, on, on the first level, and uh, those can simply be data inputs. So let me give you uh, intuition of why this still maintains proof of space security and why we need to reverse the edges in each level. Um, so again, the graph is an expander as an undirected graph, so if you look at the targets and dependencies of any given node, okay, that is large. And if we go up one level, then the targets of this uh, node C14 become dependencies of C9, which is another label that we need to rederive the encoding of C14. And the target, the dependencies of, of C14 become the targets, which in turn become dependencies in the next level. So if you bump two levels up, then the dependencies expand, just like it did with bipartite. Um, expander graphs. And so uh, with roughly double the number of levels, you get the same effect of dependencies expanding. And this is not a proof. The analysis has to go through more careful analysis of all the things a prover could do. Um, but in the end, we only need levels which are uh, proportional to log 1 over epsilon, where epsilon is the tightness we want. And the extraction is parallelizable because um, once you have all the labels on one level, you can in parallel rederive the labels on the, the previous level until you get back the data. So thank you. That is the end of this talk. Are there any questions? I have a philosophical question sure. about uh, these uh, proofs of space, yes. especially the uh, reusable, uh, reusability of the space and uh, the fact that you are uh, having uh, uh, useful uh, proofs that allow you to continue to store other data, yes. like your movies. So if I'm trying to prove that I have 2 to the 40 memory, mm -hmm. I actually don't have it, but uh, Amazon has it. Yes. If uh, uh, Amazon can continue to store in their databases all the movies that uh, yeah. and other data that they are storing, and uh, they will let me uh, uh, rent the, the memory for one second very cheaply because uh, it doesn't cost them any extra. Mm -hmm. And therefore, people will be able to uh, uh, pretend that they have the 2 to the 40 memory, even though they are renting it out. So did you think about the economic issues of uh, proofs of space, especially when they are uh, uh, reusable? Yeah, yes. No, I... I have thought about that, and, and, and other people have, um, have as well pointed that out in general about any useful form, of, like useful proofs of work as well, would have a similar issues. Um, it's more that then, then Amazon is sort of dominating the, the mining of the system, but it doesn't, uh, the, the, the impact is that you don't have this effect where, as in Bitcoin, the miners are 
you know, economically committed to Bitcoin as a network because they're invested in it since they need their mining hardware in order, and it's not useful for anything else. Uh, Amazon doesn't really care about Bitcoin and continue to store files. Uh, these would be extremely inefficient for Amazon to run. <laughs> so uh, maybe we don't want to make them too efficient. <laughs> so, but, um, but it's an excellent point, and uh, there's a philosophical debate about that. Yes, thank you. There was another question here. Also, also related to that property of reusing, reusing the proof of space, because I'm one, because sometimes you would like to prove that you have a new space, so you so you wouldn't like this property of reusability actually. So is that because I, I, I don't know? So I have some proof, and then I I'm doing a proof for someone else, so I don't want maybe to reuse the same proof. Or, I mean, because uh, yeah, so reusability doesn't uh, contradict that goal. Uh, so the point of the, the proof of space is that it's a proof of persistent space. You commit to um, storing, uh, say, a gigabyte of space, and you can continuously prove that you're still using that gigabyte. If you want to then use more space, you can bump that up to two gigabytes by producing an independent proof of space with a different um, you know, uh, protocol identifier. And if those compose, then you're showing that you have twice the amount of space. The point is that you can reuse the same resources to continue to produce proofs that you're still using that space. And the fact that, so it looks like in your construction, like you have a lot more dependencies in the, in the graph. Yeah. The, the, the graph is basically roughly the same size as previous, or the, the, graph, the size of the graph is also bigger, like twice bigger. And also, uh, and also the, the, the number of edges is bigger, so mm -hmm. maybe that poses some constraints on the prover as well? Um, yeah, so the, the, the graph that I have is, is considerably bigger than the, the, the data, but the prover only stores the labels on the last level, which is the size of the data. Um, but it, re it requires you know, going through several steps of derivation in order to get there. Yeah. In fact, one advantage I didn't mention about the second construction over the first is that the first construction, um, it, because it doesn't have this locality property, it requires the prover to na naively, the prover would have to use a buffer of size twice the data in order to derive the, the data storage because it needs to keep around the labels on the previous level in order to, to derive the next level. Whereas in the last construction, it can, um, once it has the, the labels on a given level, it can basically replace them one by one as it's deriving the levels on the next. And it only needs to use overall, um, you know, end storage in order to derive the last level rather than a buffer of size 2n. Yeah. Are there any other questions? There's one up. Um, so thank you for your talk. Uh, I had a question regarding the interactiveness of the proof. In yes. your pictures, at least, they were all interactive. Mm -hmm. uh, can they be made non-interactive for the persistent uh, proof of space? Um, thank you. Uh, it, that's an interesting question. So um, classically, no. However, uh, if you had uh, an, I an, I an ideal realization of, of a random beacon, one that would uh, just spit out random numbers at specific time intervals, unpredictable random numbers, and that could be used to replace the random challenges that come at intervals from the, uh, you know, from the verifier, but that requires a realization of a, of a random beacon. And there's proposals for that, but, uh, you know, requires much stronger assumptions. <laughs>